Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Dynamic Life Baptist Ministries. We thank you so much for tuning in. We thank you so much for being here. We pray that you are having a, a safe and blessed evening. And we just thank you for taking the time to join us here uh, to <coughs> spend some time <coughs> excuse me, in the word of the Lord and before the Lord uh, this evening on Wednesday. Um, uh, as a pastor, as an American citizen, as a father, uh, as someone who lives in a country that I believe has been very blessed uh, in its existence, <coughs> it behooves me, and I would be remiss to not say something in reference to the activities of our day. I know many of you have probably been watching TV or the news and various news channels, and you know uh, the events that have transpired today and uh, the protests uh, that have resulted in our capital and our Washington, D.C. on those who are voting on the ballots. And uh, you've seen that. You don't need me to give you the gritty details of that. Um, uh, hopefully, as believers, Christians, you have been in prayer uh, for our nation, for our leadership. Um, we have here this week at Dynamic Life been doing what we traditionally do every year, the first week of January, a prayer and consecration week where we started off the week praying for our leaders and praying for uh, the persecuted church and praying for families and we'll continue to pray for various uh, entities that make up churches in our country and families. But uh, uh, I felt uh, burdened to talk a little bit about the situation in our country as we were talking about the seven churches of Revelation and uh, those of you who have tuned into our gospel-based reconciliation Facebook page or even heard messages preached from the pulpit or taught on Wednesday nights know that uh, for me the, the major problem in our country is the church Christians mm -hmm. are not um, fulfilling their God-ordained roles as described by God to be the salt and light to make an impact in our world the way that we are uh, intended to make an impact as God has designed the church, the body of Christ, um, disciples, believers, whatever term you want to use for those that are followers of Christ, those who have inherited eternal life, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sin and uh, have been cleansed and are being cleansed daily uh, from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day we look forward to being free from the presence of sin. Um, so while we are here on earth, it is our divine assignment as given by the King of King and the Lord of Lords, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to fulfill the great commission found in Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20, to go into all the world and make disciples, uh, to uh, make disciples, followers, learners, of Christ, those who reflect Christ in their daily living, their thought process, their decision making, their allegiances, their choices. Um, and they are to be people who come from every ethnic group, every background, every culture, every, uh, the term we would use is race. Uh, um, our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ, and that impacts how we think, that impacts what we do, that impacts how we vote, that impacts who we support, who we don't support, that impacts the fact that we stand for truth even when we may like people, um, when they are not reflecting that truth. We, we do not um, take biases, we do not support unrighteousness, we do not support unholiness. We are the people of the light, not of the darkness. We are the people who live soberly, we are not the drunk people who get drunk at night and carouse and and, and have unbalanced thinking and unbalanced lives. We, we are the salt, we are the hedge that is the hedge protection against the flow and outworking of sin so that sin doesn't dominate uh, a particular context, culture, or, or clients as it will be people. Um, but uh, we have failed and we are failing as churches to fulfill our God ordained role to pray for our governmental leaders um, whether we agree with all of their policies and politics does not matter. We, we pray for the position that they hold. We pray for the fact that they have 
so many decisions to make that we could not even imagine uh, that God would lead them, that God would guide them, that God would influence them, and that when they decide to reject the ways of God, that God will show mercy and grace uh, to people and protect us from the evil choices, the evil thoughts. Uh, but we have seen, I have seen, and many of you have seen, through social media and through uh, newspaper articles, through Twitter, through tweets, through mm -hmm. Facebook, whatever the, the social media or avenue may be, so many Christians, people who, prof who profess to be Christians, uh, responding in ways that does not look like a disciple or a follower of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I would never um, fight against or, uh, or support anyone that would hinder anyone's ability to, to have their point of view. But we as Christians have a calling and a responsibility to make sure our point of view lines up with God's point of view as given to us in the scriptures, as we are led in discernment and being filled by the Holy Spirit, we do not have the right to support that which God does not support, to um, argue in a way that does not reflect uh, the love, the mercy, the patience, the compassion, the concern, the care uh, of God himself and Christ himself. And um, I think that uh, churches really need to take a look at themselves. And when I say churches, I, I don't mean the building. I don't mean the carpet. I don't mean the pews. I don't mean the instruments. I don't mean the pulpit. I mean the people. Mm -hmm. We as people of God, those who are claiming to be people of God, we really need to take a look at ourselves. And pastors, um, let me encourage you. Let me challenge you. I am a pastor. I know the difficulty and challenges that come with being a pastor. I know the, the fears and concerns that come with being a pastor and taking stands that may not be popular and that the people that you minister to may not agree with and that sometimes it will cost you, but that's what it is to be a disciple. That's what it is to be a follower of Christ. That's what it is to be a leader. A leader that is called by God, a man that is called by God, takes the stance that God or Christ himself would take if he was in that position. And that doesn't always make you popular. It does not always make you comfortable. Sometimes it, you'll be like the Church of Smyrna that we've already studied in previous nights where suffering and rejection and then jailing and beatings and torture. Uh, there are believers all around the world who are suffering uh, for taking their stand for Christ and not taking their stand with the world and not taking their stand with popular vote or popular opinion or with their family members or with some religious viewpoint that is different than the Christian viewpoint. But we in America have become so apathetic and so lukewarm about so many things that we don't even know we're lukewarm. Mm -hmm. And um, if we don't wake up as the church soon, uh, you think things are bad now, you have seen nothing yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where we're going and what we're in danger of because you are so lukewarm you don't understand just how heated things will become and uh, it's my charge as a pastor and I'm not here to give my political views I, I don't know if I really have any political views I have biblical views I don't know if I really have any political views um, but uh, the news media is so slanted I, I was observing various news outlets as I was flipping through the channels, watching and listening to what was going on this afternoon and this evening. And it just, the hypocrisy, mm -hmm. uh, just by the news media, because they have a slanted view. They have, they bring their own opinions rather than just reporting the facts into the conversation. And um, it is amazing to me, and I know I may offend some people and I don't mean to, but the facts are the facts. It is amazing to me how quickly uh, our uh, government, police force, whatever your case may be, mayors responded to the rioters when it was affecting the politically elite. Mm -hmm. But when the riots were happening in the hood, mm -hmm. in the urban context, with those who were not the politically 
elite. But businesses of innocent people who had done nothing to have their businesses burned or, or, or broken into and to have their merchandise stolen, there was not that kind of response to protect those people. And anyone who doesn't see that and admit that is just not being honest about what's going on. Uh, they did not allow those people to storm and continue to storm the Capitol because the Capitol contains the political elite. But when it came to neighborhood businesses and homes and restaurants, there was not the same protection for the common folk. And that's the America you live in. You know, I just was listening before I came into the Bible study and um, President Clinton made the comment and everyone's making the comment, comment that they believe that America is made up of basically good people. Read your Bible. <laughs> Everyone's not what God says. The Bible says there are none good, no, not one. Romans mm -hmm. chapter 9 and 10, if you want to check me out. Um, that people at their very core are evil and sinful and selfish and self centered. Uh, but we as Christians act like that's not true. And we act like that the people who are reporting the news aren't sinful aren't evil, don't have evil intentions in their heart. And I'm not a supporter of protests. You, you know that if you've been on my Gospel Facebook page, uh, Gospel-Based Reconciliation Facebook page. I'm not a supporter of riots and, and, and protests. But if you're going to let one group do it, you got to let everybody do it. Mm -hmm. If it's right for one to be able to vote their discontent over something they don't agree with, then you got to give everybody the same right. But somehow, those who don't agree with a certain group don't have the right to voice their discontent when other people had the right to voice their discontent because we said we have a constitution and we're American citizens that allow us to voice our discontent. Mm -hmm. Well, which one is it? Which one is it? And so that's for the political people. That's for the everyday people, but we as Christians need to take our protest to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. We need to get on our knees. We need to get on our faces. We need to get before our God, our Lord and Savior, our King, our President, our ruler, and make our petitions known. We need to be in the throne room of God, speaking to God on behalf of our nation. Right. And Satan has done a, a great job of shutting us down and mm -hmm. uh, keeping us quiet and making us retreat back up in our homes. And who's, who's going before the throne room? Who's bomb rushing the throne of God to get his attention to speak on behalf of those who can't speak and don't want to speak to him? That's our role as churches. That's our role as Christians, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you want to check me out. As Daniel did in Daniel chapter 9 and made his petition before God about the sinfulness of the people who made up the nation and identified with the sinfulness of the people and pleaded with God to have mercy and grace and to make his way known. We aren't doing that. We're, we're having great... Uh, aerobic exercise services where people are sweating and jumping and flipping and flopping and but we're not praying we're not making petitions we're not uh, finding and seeking God's way we're not demonstrating uh, the study that we had lined up for tonight brotherly love like the Church of Philadelphia I was just sent something on Facebook and, and we got two brothers of an organization that I that I'm a part of going at each other like two unsaved people, threatening one another's life, threatening this, if I see you, don't be surprised what happens when we see each other. What kind of Christianity is that? What, what, what kind of godliness is that? What kind of holiness is that? I don't care who's right, who's wrong. It's not Christian. And then we put it on social media for everybody to see. <clears throat> 
Shame on us. I'm calling the church as Jesus has been calling the seven churches in Revelation to repent. I'm calling us to acknowledge our sinfulness before God and our apathy and our complacency. I'm calling the churches to recognize that they have strayed and that pastors have allowed their people to stray because they have strayed away, away from our primary responsibility as Christians, individually and corporately. It's time for us to get God's house right, and then maybe God can do something with the White House. Amen. It's time for us to get our individual houses right, and then maybe God can do something with the House of Representatives. Amen. It's time for us to get our individual lives right, and then maybe God can do something with Trump, Biden, Pence, or Harris. But until God's people do what they were designed to do as a result of their confession of faith in Jesus Christ, to make intercession on behalf of people who can't make intercession for themselves, to make petitions on behalf of people who can't petition God themselves, to pray for people who can't pray to God for themselves, to love one another like God loves them, to show compassion to one another like God has showed compassion to them, to care for one another like God cares for us. Mm -hmm. Until we get our own house in order, until we get our own lives in order, we have nothing to say to the culture. Mm -hmm. And we have nothing to say about the culture. Mm -hmm. It's time for Christians. It's time for churches. It's time for pastors. It's time for individual leaders who call themselves followers of God but may hold various titles in the world to stand up for Jesus and let it be known. We will not bow to man. We will only bow to God. Amen. We don't do that with an arrogant attitude. We do that because that's who we are. And that's what we've been called to do to go into all the world and make disciples, followers, learners, people who give their total allegiance to Jesus Christ above everyone and anything else. But because they do that, because they give their total allegiance to Christ, because they are learners and followers of Jesus Christ, they love people, the good, the bad, the ugly. They show compassion and care for other people. Not just the saved, but the unsaved. Mm -hmm. You see, the unsaved people, dear brothers and sisters, are not our enemy, they're our mission field. Mm -hmm. We have been left here on a reach and rescue mission. Mm -hmm. Not a mission to judge other people. Yes. And to cast other people into hell as if they have no hope. As long as they are breathing, there is hope. God can save them. But if we're not going and preaching the gospel throughout the world and living the gospel that we preach and demonstrating changed lives, then our message falls null and void. When we're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, but by man-made gimmicks and flesh alone, we can't impact the world. And we have all the authority to do so from our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Amen. We have resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead Amen. as we go forward. Amen. We have the truth of God's word that does not compromise. Amen. We have everything we need, but we don't live like we have everything we need. Amen. We are divided across lines that have no eternal significance. Mm -hmm. We are divided by races and colors that have no eternal significance. We are divided by political forums that have no eternal significance. Mm -hmm. Nations have come and nations have gone. Yeah. Yeah. 
but God still rules hmm. from on high. Amen. Amen. Let me encourage you who are listening that are Christians and you feel like there's no hope and that it's never going to get fixed. The day of man only lasts for a little while. Amen. Amen. But the day of the Lord is coming. Amen. The day where God will set everything right. Where everyone who did not believe there was a God will find out he's real. But it'll be too late for them to make a change then. That's why. Rather than promoting political messages mm -hmm. or social messages or sports messages, we need to be promoting the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because it's the gospel that changed lives. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've been changed by the gospel, it seems like you would go out and share the gospel mm -hmm. so that it can change other folk. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you, based on the authority of scripture, everybody claiming they've been changed ain't been changed. Mm -hmm. But when you really have been impacted by God himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is manifesting that reality in your life, you don't get caught up in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. We got a different agenda. Mm -hmm. We work for a different king. Mm -hmm. We have a different Lord and master. Mm -hmm. And he rules. Whether you believe it or not, or whether you see it or not, he rules. Just read the record between Genesis and Revelation. Mm -hmm. So I'm challenging pastors. I'm challenging assistant pastors. I'm challenging associate pastors. I'm challenging elders, bishops, whatever you call yourself. I'm challenging deacons and deaconess. I'm challenging the Christian in the front pew to the back pew. Let's stop supporting worldly agendas and get back to kingdom business. Mm -hmm. There's no hope for our world if Christians fail to do their job, to fulfill their calling, to fulfill their commission, to fulfill their role as God has designed it in the scriptures. I'm challenging my people to do that. I'm challenging myself to do that. And I'm challenging you tonight. Get on your knees. Get on your face and cry out to God on behalf of our nation. We got to live here. We might as well try to have as much peace as we can while we <laughs> until it's time to go. We don't want to live in the midst of chaos and disorder. It's coming. It's inevitable. But we can't at least try to be a hedge against it. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 2 tells us, so that we may live peaceable lives. That's why we pray. And it starts with men. Men are hard. Pride, egos, the feminization of men in America. Good women can't find good men. God can't find good men. Men have to lead the way. That doesn't mean women aren't important. You have your role as designed in scripture. Ladies, the greatest job you can have if God allows you to be married and have children is to be a mother. Mm -hmm. There is no greater role that you can fulfill. Mm -hmm. Let me share this with you. There is no greater role that I can fulfill than being a pastor. Mm -hmm. To become president, mayor, governor would be a step down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Yes. <laughs> to become president, governor, mayor, senator, house of, Re house of representative, whatever, head of a major corporation would be a step down. There's no greater role that any man can fulfill than being a pastor. <clears throat> and that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a world where people's hearts are hard. They're distracted by so many things. You have an enemy that never sleeps, none never slumbers. You have people who are in the midst of being shaped and molded into the image of Christ. And sometimes they look good and sometimes they don't look so good. Sometimes they love you and sometimes they hate you. But there is no better calling 
No better responsibility for a man to fulfill than that of a pastor. And next in line would be a husband. No greater role that you could fill as a man than be a husband and a father. But the world, the media, TV, New York, Madison Avenue projects so many ungodly and unbiblical things that we buy into. So once again, as we sit here in our Wednesday night Bible study and as this goes out over Facebook, it may not get many likes, it may not get many views. But I pray that if God can change one person Amen. based on what they've heard tonight, Amen. it's been worth sharing it with you. Amen. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Yeah. We're not even going to get to the box study now. It don't matter. Because our world needs us to pray. Yeah. And not only does our world need us to pray, our world needs us to practice mm -hmm. what we preach. Wow what the scripture says. The world needs us to care and show compassion mm -hmm. without compromising mm -hmm. and becoming hypocritical. The world needs us not to be so much in our Bibles that we're never involved in the world. Mm -hmm. To show the love of Christ. To share who Christ really is and why they really need to come to him. Father, we just thank you so much. So many churches are confused about why they even exist. Because so many leaders in the church don't know why the church exists. So many people are misled about what the church is to be all about. But you know that we know that here at 1916 Central Avenue, we're not confused. For you have taught us from your word you have taught us from your leaders. You have put examples of it in the membership. So we come to you on behalf of the United States of America. The world needs you, but right now, tonight, we're just crying out for America. This is where we live. This is where you allowed us to be born and to be raised. So it is here as Christians that we make intercession on behalf of the United States of America. Father, you see the news too. But you see even more clearly than we can see because you see the hearts. You see the minds. You see the attitudes. You see the mentalities of men and women boys and girls, blacks and whites and Asians and Hispanics and Nepalis and Bhutanese and Africans and you know how the list goes. Father, our nation is in trouble. Riots, protests, anger, bitterness, hypocrisy, divisiveness, biblical illiteracy, We're in trouble. We're going down fast and we don't even realize it as a nation. You know that we have a sense of American pride to where we think we're invulnerable as a nation. But you have given us glimpses down through history we're not invulnerable. The Civil War almost split this country asunder. World War I and World War II could have went another way and we could all be speaking Chinese or Japanese or German. Planes ran into buildings in 9-11 and we have forgotten. We're not invulnerable. But like that great Roman Empire, we don't even see that we can destroy ourselves from the inside out. We are a prideful nation. We mention you only to use your name. We put it on money, we put it on coins, but we don't worship you. We take your commandments out of buildings. 
We remove prayer from schools. We remove your name from being even spoken anywhere and even from the church house. Father, we should be on our knees crying for mercy and forgiveness and repenting. But our arrogance, our pride, the fact that we think we are so great that we can never be brought low hinders us. But it's like that old analogy of the frogs in the kettle. I feel the water getting hotter. It was comfortable for a while. But things are starting to heat up to a point where we're all kind of trying to jump out, but it's going to be too late. So we here at this church call to existence by your name and by your power. The church that you have sustained by your grace and by your mercy comes before the throne room of God and says, Father, have mercy. Help us. Help us as a nation to turn our hearts and minds back to you. And that starts with your church. That starts with people who are called out by your name. That starts with people who claim allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ above all other kings and all other lords and all other masters. That starts with us humbling ourselves before you. Father, Lord Jesus, hear our cry. Hear our plead. Forgive us as a nation. Forgive us as churches within this nation of losing sight of what is important. Father, you are what's important. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is important. Your agenda, what you're trying to accomplish, where you are going in history as you have revealed it in your word is what's important. Forgive us for becoming distracted, <coughs> falling in love with this world system in a way that Romans chapter 12 tells us not to fall in love, not to let this world system put its makeup on us and make us into this, its image rather than us being made into the image of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for having messed up values and priorities. Forgive us for being asleep when we should be awake. Forgive us for being drunk when we should be sober. Forgive us for <laughs> abiding in darkness when we are made and called to abide in the light. Forgive us. Forgive your people. It starts with your people. It starts with those who have claimed allegiance to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It starts with your people who are to be a people of the book, of the word, of the scriptures. It starts with us. It starts with us getting back to our prime objective, going into the world to make disciples, reaching out to people from all ethnic groups and cultures and backgrounds, teaching them to observe what you've commanded us to do, identifying them with you through baptism, identification, trusting in your presence to be with us as we do this. We need your Holy Spirit to send us to Jerusalem, to Dia Samaria, and to the other parts of the world to be witnesses, and if necessary, martyrs on your behalf. 
Cleanse the household of God. Purify your people. Renew the fire of your desires. And may we delight ourselves in the Lord. <coughs> and then he will give us the desires of our hearts. Because our desires will be what he delights in. And he delights to give what he desires. So many distractions. This world has a way of lullabying us to sleep. The world has a way of getting us drunk with lust and money and fame and fortune and prosperity. This world has a way of darkening and hiding us under a bushel so we don't shine. But we're asking tonight, Lord, that you will free us as your people from those chains that Satan and this world tries to put us in. The churches all around the world and throughout this country will repent and be revived and reinvigorated <clears throat> and reassembled together to fight the true enemy, Satan, flesh, sin, this world system. Hear our prayer. Hear our cry. Hear our petition. We lay it before you. And we are ready to do your bidding. I pray that pastors will follow suit all over this country and all over this world. The congregations will hear and follow suit. The Christians individually will hear and follow suit. And you will bring revival in this land to this nation because you've brought a revival to your people first, to your household, the church. We commend this to you and only to you. <coughs> and it is in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. God bless you. Good night.